Okay, so today's talk is understanding your heart. So we're just going to be going through the common things that happen to your heart, so how your heart works normally, what can go wrong, and what the doctors might want to do about it. Um, I've got a few slides collected together about the things that most people want to know, but if I'm not covering specifically what you want to know, then do not. Okay. Right, so we start off with a little bit of an anatomy lesson, really, just to make sure everybody knows what the structure of the heart is. So the heart has four chambers, or four compartments. It's a left and right atrium, those are the compartments at the top of the heart, and a left and right ventricle, those are the compartments at the bottom of the heart. And it's the job of the right side of the heart to pump blood up to the lungs to get more oxygen put into it, and then it comes back to the heart, to the left side, and it's the job of the left side of the heart to pump that blood that's now full of oxygen all around the body to every bit of your body that needs it. Okay? So we've got that on a little picture, which looks like that. So don't worry too much about the labelling of it, but this is the right side of the heart. Hearts are always labelled as though they're in you. So keep thinking it's labelled the wrong way around, but they always label the heart as though it's in you. So the right side of the heart is coloured blue, to notice that that blood hasn't got any oxygen in it, it's just come back from all the bits of your body, they've used it all up, and then it goes back to the right side of the heart and off up to the lungs to get some more oxygen put in it. And then that blood that's now magically turned red, <laughs> to meaning that it's now full of oxygen, comes back to the left side of the heart, and then it gets pumped up through the aorta, which you might have heard of again, that's the biggest blood vessel in the body, and where it then gets distributed all around the body. So while we're talking about the left and the right side of the heart, the right side of the heart has quite an easy job of it compared to the left, because it's only got to pump blood to the lungs and back, which isn't very far, so it doesn't have to work quite as hard. Meanwhile, the left side of the heart has to pump blood all around the body. So the left side of the heart has to work a bit harder. And if you just bank that thought for a moment, because a bit later on we'll come back to some problems that arise because of that. Okay, I'm just going to pass around a couple of models of the heart as well, they're both the same, so if we put one over here and one over there, you can be having a look at those alongside the slides that are going up, while we also talk about something else that's inside the heart and that's the valves. So the valves in the heart make sure that the blood only flows in the direction we want it to go in and that it doesn't turn around and go back where it's just come from. So if your valves don't open when they're supposed to, or if they don't close properly when they're supposed to, then that can affect the flow of blood around the heart and around the body, and it means that the heart might have to work a bit harder. So some of you might have been told in the investigations that you may have had that your valve is a little bit leaky, that's the word the doctors might use, or sometimes they use the posh word which is regurgitation. So what that means is there's a little bit of a leak at the valve, it's not closing properly, and a little bit of blood is escaping back the way it's just come. And as we all get older, we all tend to have a little bit of that going on anyway, but if it gets to a point where that's actually causing you problems, then they might need to talk to you about whether you might need to have your valves repaired or replaced, depending on how bad it is. Okay. And again, we've got a picture of that. So if you haven't got the models coming to you yet, this is what you find when you lift off the little lid on the model. You can see these little white spindly things here. These are the valves. So there are others in the heart, but the main ones that we'll talk about <coughs> is the aortic and the mitral valve, which are the two valves that are on the left side of the heart. So these are commonly the ones that people have trouble with and commonly the ones that are repaired or replaced. But it is also possible to have problems with the right ones as well, the ones on the right side of the heart called the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid valve. So it is possible to repair and replace those, but it's less common than these two. Right. Everyone with me so far? Good. Okay. So we know now that the heart is responsible for pumping blood around the body, and all of that blood is passing inside the heart. What we're now going to look at is the outside of the heart where we have things called coronary arteries. So this is blood now flowing around the outside of the heart, feeding the heart muscle itself with oxygen or fuel. 
And in order for the heart muscle to work effectively, it needs that good fresh blood supply that's full of oxygen for it to do its job. So on this picture here, we've got a kind of simplified diagram of the uh, coronary arteries. And it mainly talks about a right coronary artery and a left coronary artery. So technically, you have two coronary arteries, a left and a right. But because the left one divides into two big branches, often the doctors will talk about three different coronary arteries because of the two big branches of the left one. Okay, so the right one is quite straightforward, right coronary artery. And if you have an angiogram report or an angioplasty report at home, it might mention the RCA this or the RCA the other. That's what they're usually used for the abbreviation for the right coronary artery. Meanwhile, the left one starts off as just one artery, and that first bit is called the left main stem, and they'll abbreviate that often to LMS. And then it divides into two branches, a left anterior descending branch, or LAD, and a circumflex branch, which they usually abbreviate with a big C and a little X. Okay, so if you've come into hospital, or you've had your angiogram or your angioplasty done, you hopefully will know that you may have had a stent put in your LAD branch, or your circumflex branch, or your RCA branch, or if you don't know that, you might want to go back and find that paperwork now, and you'll be able to make sense of it to know what that all means. So when we do an angiogram and we put the dye into the system, it shows us whether the blood flow is good, or whether it's narrowed, or whether it's blocked anywhere in those three main artery branches. Any questions on that? No? Everyone's still with me? Good. <coughs> okay, so if these coronary arteries become narrowed, or even worse, if they become blocked, then the heart muscle won't get the blood flow that it needs. So it won't get the oxygen and the fuel that it needs in order to do its job. And that can affect how well it can pump blood around the body. Because if the heart muscle itself hasn't got enough fuel, then it can't squeeze and push quite as strongly as it needs to. So if we look at this top one here, this is what we hope all of our arteries look like. So if we took a little section of our coronary artery and was able to look inside it, this is what we would hope that is the case, is that if you think of it as a section of a hose pipe, and there's nice smooth lining to the inside of the artery there, and this represents the blood trying to flow through the artery. So in this top picture here, the blood can get through, there's no blockages, there's no bottlenecks, no problem. But often when we find, when we do our angiograms, what we find is that some of this yellowy stuff here, which is fatty stuff, so sometimes the doctors will call it fat, sometimes they'll call it plaque, sometimes they'll call it atheroma, or atherosclerosis, it's a very long word for the same thing. What that basically means is that fatty stuff has come along in the artery and instead of passing on through, has actually stuck to the wall of the artery. And that has the effect, if you get enough of it, that it narrows the artery so the blood can still get through, but it's a bit of a bottleneck. So it won't be able to push as much blood through that artery with that fat in it as we could with this artery. Okay, another model I'll pass round. It's just a little model of an artery showing that process. <coughs> so the posh word for that process, this process of having fatty stuff laying down on the in inner lining of the arteries, is coronary heart disease. So that's what the NHS calls that system, that, uh, that, that disease process, if you like. So you may find that in your letters it says CHD this or CHD the other. Or your GP may write to someone and say that you've got a history of CHD. And what they're talking about there is coronary heart disease. So that's the NHS word for this narrowing of the coronary arteries. And because we know that if we find a bit of narrowing in the coronary arteries, it does have the potential to cause damage. If we don't do anything about it and we just leave it, it might well get worse and then one day actually block off an artery. And that's what happens when you have a heart attack, is that an artery is not just narrowed, but it's become blocked off which means that the blood supply can't get to that part of your heart muscle. And if we don't do something to fix that quickly, i.e. get into hospital and let us fish that clot back out again, it means that it can cause a little bit of scarring and damage to the heart muscle. So that's why it's important to get to hospital quickly if you think you're having a heart attack, 
so that you can get to the catheter lab and we can get into the artery and try and unblock that artery and restore the blood flow to that part of your heart muscle. We also know that once we've found that process happening in one artery, it does put you at risk of it happening again. So because we know that, what we want to try and do is to reduce all the risks that we know are out there that of, of this process getting any worse, right down to the bare minimum. So things like keeping your blood pressure under control, keeping your blood cholesterol low, stopping smoking, watching your alcohol content and consumption, uh, managing your stress, doing some regular exercise, all those things that we know are risk factors. So you, if you can manage those risk factors and do the things that we recommend, that helps to lower your risk of this process getting worse in the future, as do taking the tablets that you're prescribed. So a lot of the tablets you'll be taking are specifically given to you to help lower the risk of this process getting worse in the future. But more about that after the coffee break when we talk about pills. So even when you've had the disease treated, so even if you've come into hospital and you've had a stent fitted, or you might have had a bypass done, you still have coronary heart disease. So you're not cured, as it were. You still have coronary heart disease because that fat that was in your artery is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. We've moved it into a place where it can't cause so much mischief, mischief if you've had a stent fitted or we've gone around it to give you an extra artery to help feed the heart muscle if we've done a bypass. But the fat is still there, it's still in the artery, so you still have coronary heart disease, and you still are at risk of it getting worse in the future, and that's why it's important to take the tablets long term, and also do all of these things that we recommend long term, to try and help reduce the risk of that happening in the future. Any questions on that at all? I just, just one question, because I think it's got ischemic heart disease. Same, same thing, thing. yes, yeah, another posh word for the same thing. Ischemia means lack of oxygen. So ischemic heart disease, coronary heart disease, all the same thing. Okay, so if we just talk a little bit about angina. So an, an angina is a, another NHS speak word for <coughs> any symptoms that you might get if your heart muscle isn't getting enough blood. So the one that people generally think of when you say, do you get any angina, is chest pain. So people think that angina equals chest pain. But it isn't always chest pain, and it isn't always pain. Some people would describe it more as a tightness or a pressure in the chest. And it doesn't have to just be in the chest. It could be left or right side of chest. It could be down one arm or both arms. It can be up into the throat round into the jaw, and also between the shoulder blades at the back. So pretty much anything from the waist up might be an angina symptom. So try not to think just of chest pain. Think of other sort of discomfort feelings that you might be getting. Um, now occasionally, and particularly more in diabetic patients for some reason, they are less likely to feel pain, and often will get other sort of side effect, uh, uh, symptoms, sorry, such as extreme shortness of breath. So one minute you're all right, and then the next minute, over like a wave comes over you and you're very out of breath very suddenly. So it's not the same as when you're just going up and down the stairs and you get a bit puffed out. Yeah, it's one minute you're fine, and the next minute you get this sudden wave of shortness of breath come over you. Or sudden wave of extreme tiredness, like all the energy is sort of drained out of you. Okay, so as I say, that's more common with diabetic patients, but it doesn't necessarily only refer to diabetic patients. So if you get these sort of symptoms, it could be a sign that your heart muscle is not getting enough oxygen that it needs in order to do its job. And they will often occur at one of two times. And they're both times when the heart has to work harder. So when the heart has to work harder, it needs more blood so that it can do it. And if your arteries are a bit narrowed and the blood can't get there quick enough, that's your body's way of telling you it's not getting enough blood to the heart muscle and you need to do something about it. So the two times when you will generally make your heart work harder will be when you're exercising. So it might be that you've decided to go off out for a nice long walk this morning or a brisk walk or you might have had to run for a bus or something like that. So you're doing some exercise which means the heart has to work harder and that might be a time when these symptoms come on. Or the other time when your heart has to work harder is if you get very stressed and worried and anxious about something. Because when you get stressed and worried, 
you get a, a hormone called adrenaline released into the bloodstream and one of the things that adrenaline does is to make the heart beat faster and work harder and therefore it needs more blood. So that's another time that you could potentially feel angina symptoms is if you get stressed and worried and anxious. So the next thing is what would we do about it if that did happen? Anyone got any ideas? <laughs> So if you were out for your brisk walk this morning and you start to feel a little bit of tightness in your chest, what would you do about it? Okay, so stop what you're doing, so that's a good thing. So by stopping the exercise, that immediately means that the heart doesn't have to work so hard, yeah? If you've got a handy chair to sit down as well, that's even better, because it's even less work. Okay, and how long should we give it to see if it goes away all by itself, having stopped what we're doing and sat down? Ten minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, so give it five minutes only to see if it's going to go away all by itself. And if it doesn't, what are we going to do next? What was that? So, <laughs> well, hopefully there will be one step before that. You should all if, have a, a spray. That's right. So if you have had an angiogram and they have found some sort of narrowing in the arteries around your heart, you will hopefully have also been given a GTN spray. Is there anybody that hasn't got one? that's in that category. Okay. We can talk about it later if you want to ask any questions why you haven't got one. So the idea is that you stop what you're doing, you sit down and you wait and see if it goes away all by itself, but you only give it five minutes. Okay? And if it's not going away all by itself, then you get that spray out and you squirt it under the tongue. And the reason for under the tongue is because it very quickly will get into the bloodstream from there. And what it does when that drug gets into the system is to widen the arteries. So it relaxes the muscle in the walls of the artery, which means that the artery relaxes and opens a little bit wider. That means that more blood can get through a bit easier, and hopefully that will also then mean that your angina symptoms should be relieved. Okay, so we've had a squirt of GTN. How long are we going to give it to see if it works? Five minutes. Five minutes, good. And then what will we do if it hasn't? Second go, yes, yeah, so you can have a second go with the spray, yeah, and wait another five minutes, and then if it hasn't gone, 999, nine, nine. yeah. So the reason for that is two lots of spray have widened that artery as much as we possibly can using that drug, and if that hasn't got rid of your symptoms, there is always a possibility that a little blood clot has come along and blocked that artery, which is what happens when you have a heart attack. And so we can't fix a heart attack with GTN. So if that has happened, we need you to then ring 999 to get into hospital quickly so that if it is a heart attack, we can do something about unblocking it quickly before that bit of heart muscle um, will die if it's not getting any bloodstream to it. Yeah? Okay, just going to show you a quick little video just highlighting those points again. Hello! So, you're here to find out what it's like to have a, a heart attack. Well, we don't have much time because with heart attacks you never do. Well, let's start with the first symptom most people think of. Yes, chest pains. Well, we've all heard of the classic chest pains, but it may not always be that severe. It could be a bit of tightness or discomfort in and around the chest. No doubt you'll shrug this off. I mean, uh, slight chest discomfort, tightness, not worth worrying about, right? Wrong. What if it spreads to your arms? Still not convinced you're having a heart attack? Well, what if you feel dizzy, lightheaded? Oh, still thinking, don't make a fuss. What if it spreads to your neck, to your jaw? You're probably thinking, tough it out, it will pass. What if it doesn't? The longer you leave it, the more your heart dies. How about difficulty breathing? Rising panic, sweaty, clammy. Could be indigestion, last night's curry stress. But what if it's your body telling you to get help? Don't kid yourself. If you're having chest pains or discomfort with any of these symptoms, or even if you're feeling unwell, 
dial 999. Now this may surprise you. The ambulance service would rather see you and discover it's not a heart attack than arrive too late. Every second counts. I know, you think you'd feel embarrassed if it's not actually a heart attack. But imagine how you will feel if it is, and you left it too late. Imagine that. A cheery note to <laughs> <laughs> So that's really just to reiterate those points we've just been through, really. And it was designed for, um, you know, not particularly for heart patients, just for the general public. It went out in a break between the two halves of Coronation Street or something, specifically to go on shock value, to grab everyone's attention, and to draw attention to the fact that, you know, heart attacks are not just about <coughs> chest pain. So that hopefully people, if they're out and about and they witness somebody being quite ill, they might think perhaps it is a heart attack and get help there a little bit quicker. Okay, so as we've said, a heart attack is when one of the arteries supplying blood to the heart muscle becomes blocked. So the symptoms that you get with a heart attack will be very similar to those we've just discussed with angina. But the key difference will be that they won't resolve when you use your spray. Okay, so if it's just angina, using the spray, it should all go away and you're fine to carry on with whatever you wanted to do. But if they don't resolve when you use your GTN, then it could be a heart attack. And how bad the symptoms are will depend on how big the heart attack is as well. So don't think on casualty and Holby City and what have you, they're always sort of clutching their chest and it's quite obvious that person's got a heart attack and it's quite obvious that they feel quite poorly. But some heart attacks are not like that and it is more of a mild symptom. It might just be a bit of a twinge and a bit of an ache. You don't really feel that poorly, and as he said on the video, you might sort of feel, I don't really want to bother anybody with that, but if you're getting those signs and symptoms, and they're not going away with GTN, then ring 999, and the first thing that will happen when the ambulance arrives is they'll rig you up to an ECG, and we can very quickly tell quite a bit from the ECG, and then we'll make a decision about whether you need to go to hospital or not, and then it takes all the decisions out of your hands then as well. Okay, so just a quick recap, if you get angina, you stop what you're doing, you sit yourself down. The other reason for sitting down there is not only so that you stop exercising, so that your heart doesn't have to work so hard, but one of the other things that GTN does, when it widens the arteries and relaxes the artery walls, that has the effect of dropping your blood pressure. Okay, so that's one of the side effects of GTN, is that it'll drop your blood pressure a little bit. So some people feel a little bit woozy, a little bit lightheaded after they use GTN. So it's a good idea to be sat down before you use it, in case that does happen to you. So we're going to use the GTN, wait five minutes. If the symptoms don't ease, we can do it a second time. But if after all that lot, it's not gone away, then call 999 for an ambulance. Okay. Right. So let's talk about what the doctors might want to do about this fatty stuff that's in the arteries to try and help. Um, so if the fatty plaque, so that fatty stuff that's stuck to the inner wall of the artery, if it has not become hardened, or calcified is another word they might use for that, then we can use a balloon to squash the fatty stuff to the walls of the artery, so push it to the outside of the artery wall, and then put a stent in to hold it in position there. But if the plaque has become hardened, so a little bit like lime scale in your central heating pipes, yeah, if it's gone hardened like that, then it doesn't matter how hard the balloon pushes against it, it doesn't go anywhere. So in that instance, they can use something called rotablation, which is where they put a little tiny drill bit on the end of the wire and drill away at that hardened fatty stuff to try and get rid of some of it. And then they put the stent in after that. Okay, so what we've got on the picture here is just a pictorial representation of that. So here's our artery with a bit of fatty stuff here. And so the wire has been passed into the artery, usually through the groin or sometimes through the wrist. And it finds its way into the artery on the outside of the heart. When we're level with that fatty stuff, that's the one we want to deal with, then they blow the balloon up. And the stent is lodged on the outside of that balloon, so that as the balloon inflates, it carries the stent with it out and pushes it into the artery wall. When we're happy that we've opened the artery the right amount, then we can get rid of the balloon, take the balloon back down again, and take the wire back out, 
and leave the stent in situ. Okay. And this is the same thing here, but in cross section. So this was the artery beforehand, and this is the space that the blood had to flow through that artery. And after the stent's been done, this is the space that the blood has now got to go through. But you can see that the fat is still there. We haven't got rid of it. It's still in the artery. But what we've done is pushed it into a place where it will hopefully cause less mischief. All right, I'm going to pass another couple of things around for you to have a look at now. <coughs> this is quite delicate, so if you can be a little bit careful with it. But if you look right at the end of the wire there, you can just about make out the balloon and the stent right on the end of the wire there. Okay, so if I pass that round. And there's also a little test tube here that's got a couple of stents in it, real actual stents, just to give you the idea of the size of these things. All right, so I'll pass that round with it. A couple of stents in there. Thank you. And so the average cor um, coronary artery is somewhere between three and five millimeters wide. So it's quite tiny. Okay. And while we're on the subject here, this bit here where they blow the balloon up is quite key because the, the doctors have to decide that they blow it up enough so that the stent is actually lodged into the artery wall so that it isn't just going to wander off downstream later. Yeah? So they've got to push it up enough <coughs> to make sure it stays put. So they don't want to blow it up too much because then you risk tearing the wall of the artery. Yeah? You can see here that the artery is being stretched slightly. <coughs> Look at the outside of here. <coughs> the artery gets stretched slightly while they're doing it, but you don't want to go too mad because otherwise you then can tear the artery wall. So it's quite a sort of particular amount that the doctors have to decide whether they put a bit more in or a bit less to get to that point. And because they have to do that, they actually have to push the art the, the stent, sorry, they have to push the stent into the artery wall. And when that happens, you can cause a little bit of damage to the lining of the inside of the artery wall. And because of that, that's the main reason why you take another blood thinning drug after you've had a stent. So you will probably have already been on aspirin, but then if you have a stent done, you'll be given another one on top, <coughs> so either clopidogrel or ticagrelor to take, usually for a year, but it might be six months or whatever, depending on what your consultant has decided. But the idea of that second blood thinning drug is to try and stop your body getting a little bit too overexcited to try and heal up that damage that's been done when the stent has been pushed into the wall of the artery. Because if we leave your body to its own devices, it tries to heal that up, and in the process of doing so, it can actually block the stent up. Okay, so that's what they found in the early days of stents. And if they didn't give you this other blood thinning drug, then more people were coming back with stents that had blocked up with blood clots where the body had tried to heal the damage that had been done when the stent got put in. So it is really, really important that you don't stop that second blood thinning drug until you've been told to by your cardiologist. So occasionally you might go to the dentist or something like that to have a tooth extraction and they may say to you, oh, we'll just stop your blood thinners for 48 hours. Well, don't without checking with your cardiologist because if you do stop it early, you might be putting yourself at risk of the stent blocking up. Okay? What happens when you stop taking the blood thinning drug? I mean, does, it, does the body not try to heal it up again? Well, by the time you have taken it for a year, everything is healed. So if we were able to sort of get a camera and look inside the artery a year later, so this artery, what has actually happened is the body produces a little mini layer of blood cells on the inside of that. So it, it, if we were travelling through with a camera, we wouldn't even be able to see that there was a stent there because the body sort of starts to encompass it as part of the artery wall and you get a lining of normal sort of um, blood vessel lining cells on the inside of the stent. So a year later, the damage has gone, has been and done and been sorted and dealt with, so it's safe to then stop that second blood thinning drug. You. But you carry on with the aspirin to reduce the chance of you getting clots anyway. Cool. Yes? Does the fatty stuff stick to the stent? Does fatty stuff stick to the stent? Yeah. Well, this particular bit well, here, in, no, no, in general... If you've got more phase up in the blood coming through, it can does, do. does that stick to the stent? Because the stent looks like a mesh and we haven't yes. it yet. Why? Yes. So it, it can do, yes. It can do, yes. 
which is why it's good to try and do all the things you can to reduce the amount of circulating fat that will be in your bloodstream, like watching your diet and looking at your cholesterol and keep taking the statins and what have you, all those things that help to lower the amount of um, fat that will be in your bloodstream anyway. Yeah? Yes? When I was originally in for an angiogram, there were some other patients there as day patients for, uh, well no, it actually wouldn't have been for day patients, it been overnight, um, but they were there having a stent replaced. Now what right. probably happened there? Um, well, they probably won't have been having the stent replaced, but they might have been having another one put in. So occasionally it is possible that fatty stuff comes along and collects, and it's usually at the end of the stent there. So where the blood goes through the stent, it's okay, but because there is a little bit of a, a lip or a bump or something between where the stent and the rest of the artery wall is, in some patients that can be a sort of breeding ground, if you like, an area of risk where little bits of fat can go and stick. So sometimes you can get fatty stuff, and we call that in-stent re-stenosis, which is a posh word for your stent's blocked up a bit. Yeah? So what we would do about that is we can't take that stent out and put another one in, but what we do is put another stent inside that one, probably overlapping the end there as well, so that you would end up with a much longer stent because we put two, one next to each other, to cover the bump bit there. But happily, that does not happen in everybody. But it is possible that that can happen, which is why it's important to keep taking all the tablets and doing all the other things that we tell you is a good idea to try and help lower your risk of problems in the future. Okay. Okay. All right, so I think the models are still working their way around. So if you haven't seen them yet, do shout and grab them. Uh, but again, just to reiterate, that's a blown up balloon on the end of the wire next to somebody's fingertips. So again, you can just see how small these things are. And that's why when they get clogged up with fat, it causes problems because they're not very big in the first place. So if you've then got 50% of it blocked up with uh, fat, it can cause trouble. <coughs> okay, the other treatment <coughs> excuse me, that might be offered is a coronary artery bypass graft or C-A-B-G for short. And you might hear the doctors referring to it as a cabbage, just because it's quicker to say than coronary artery bypass graft, yeah? Or they sometimes just call it a bypass. Uh, so this, in the main, is open heart surgery. So unlike the stent fitting, which will just be one puncture in either in your groin or in the wrist, and you won't have any scars anywhere else, this one they actually have to um, cut down the front of the chest and open up the chest cavity and directly operate on the heart. There are a couple of occasions where we have had patients that only need one bypass done and that artery is on the front of the heart where they can go to one of the London hospitals and have this done sort of minimally invasively or keyhole surgery style. But in the main, most people will need open heart surgery. Perhaps in the future they will have found a way of doing it that way, but in the main most people still need to have their chest opened up for a bypass. So the general idea here is that we're going to be taking arteries or veins from elsewhere in your body where you can cope without them, you don't need them because you've got a double supply to various parts of your body. So we steal those from wherever they were and stitch them back onto the heart to help improve the blood flow to the heart to go around the arteries that have become blocked or narrowed with fat. So the places that they will usually take those grafts from are the chest. So there's a couple of arteries within the chest that they can use. And if not, they will then use some from your arm. They take the inner side of your arm or the inside of your leg, depending on how many they need uh, or depend on where they take the grafts from. So in this picture, this is a picture of a normal heart that then had two bypasses attached. So this here, this is an extra coronary artery that's not normally there on a normal heart, and that's because we've taken an artery or a vein from that person's body and stitched it on here, and stitched it on here, <coughs> so that when the blood is normally coming along here and getting down to the bottom of the heart that way, it can still trickle through that way if it wants to, through the narrowed, fatty, sort of clogged up area, or the blood can go this way, around the outside and still end up in the same place. So this is like the equivalent of going through the centre of town during rush hour. You'll still get there, but you creep through very, very slowly, but you still get there in the end. 
Or you can take the town centre bypass that goes round the outside, and although it's more miles, it's a bigger distance to travel, you might well get there quicker because there's no blockages that way. So you can see we haven't replaced your artery that might have had the fatty stuff in it. We've just added another one in. So that's why you still have coronary heart disease, even after a bypass, and you still need the tablets, and you still need to do all the things that we advise you to do. This person's had a double bypass, because there's the other one that's been added on there. So we have to assume this person had some narrowing here in this artery, and here in this one. So now they've got an extra artery to help get blood flow down to the right-hand side of the heart. Okay, so that is what you would call a double bypass. Some people say they've had a quadruple bypass. That means that there's four grafts been stitched on in a variety of places. Okay. <coughs> Depending on how many they need will depend on where they take them from, whether they can get away with just using the two that's in the chest, or whether they might need to use one from the arm or the legs. Any questions on that? You're still awake. Yes? Good. <laughs> so I said it was a lot to take in, didn't I? Is there anybody here that's had a valve replacement or been told they might need a valve replacement? Okay, so that's what we'll just briefly cover next then. <coughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, if your valves are not opening properly or not closing properly, and if that gets bad enough to actually cause a problem for you, then you may have a repair or a replacement to the valves as well. So we can do either a mechanical valve replacement, so that's a metal valve, or a tissue valve, and often that will come from a pig or a cow. And there are pros and cons with each of them, so before you have your operation, the consultant should talk to you about the pros and cons and make the choice with you about which is best for you. In a nutshell, the mechanical valves tend to last a bit longer, but if you have a mechanical valve replacement, you have to be on warfarin, for the rest of your life, which is a bit of a pain because you have to keep going backwards and forwards having blood tests done at regular intervals to check how thin your blood is. Meanwhile, the tissue valves maybe don't last as long, but you don't need to take warfarin, so you haven't got all that faffing about backwards and forwards to the blood test shop. So those are kind of it's short, a shortened version of some of the pros and cons. Okay, but either way, whichever one they do, again, it's open heart surgery, so it'll be opening up the chest, just like we did with the bypass, and actually directly operating on the heart itself, and they get to the point where the damaged valve is, remove the damaged one, and stitch in place either the mechanical or the tissue valve to replace it. Okay. Now, occasionally, there is a slightly different version of an aortic valve implant that can be done a bit less invasively. Now, anyone who watches that hospital program might have heard of this. Has anybody watched that program? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a bit like a stent, but a very big stent. And this sort of funny, sort of creamy coloured stuff there, if we could look inside there, that's got the little valve opening and shutting leaflets of the valve inside it. So with this one, what it is, is a bit like having a stent fitted, so they just do the puncture in the groin again, up into the right spot, and when they're level with the aortic valve that's damaged, instead of taking away the damaged one and stitching a new one in place, what they actually do is put this one, that springs open inside your aortic valve, and then that starts to do the work of your aortic valve. So we haven't replaced your valve, we've implanted a new one inside the valve that wasn't working properly. So there's only about seven hospitals in the country that are doing this at the moment, but Brighton is one of them. So if they don't think that a, uh, the open heart type surgery for a, for a valve replacement is a good idea for you, for whatever reason, um, then they might suggest this. It's not been around quite as long as the open heart surgery version, so they'll always try and do that on everybody first, because we've got lots of evidence and research showing that that is, has a really good outcome. This has probably only been around for about the last sort of 10 years, so we're starting to pick up lots of evidence of how good they are, but it's obviously not as much as we've got on the other one. So they'll always assess first if you can have the first operation done, but if there's some reason why you can't, then they might talk about this as an option. Any other questions on that at all? No, okay, I'm going to skip those all. Right. 
So what we've talked about at the moment then is the plumbing to the heart, if you like, yes? The, the pipes that bring the blood to the, to the heart and the body. What we're going to now talk about is a little bit about electrics. Because it's no good having a heart that's got a lovely, beautiful blood supply if there's no electrical supply to it, because it's the electrical supply that makes it squeeze and relax, and therefore do its pumping job. So the heart has its own electrical system, which provides regular electrical impulses, and it's that that causes the heart muscle to contract and relax. This is a bit busy, so don't worry about all the labels. Just look at the picture, if you can, and just look at the yellow blobs to start with. <coughs> okay, so this is your heart with its four chambers, as we've mentioned already. And the big yellow blob in the corner there is called your sinus node. So the job of the sinus node is just a little area in the atrium there that sends out those electrical impulses. Okay, so that decides when to send out an electrical impulse. And when it does, these turquoise arrows here represent that impulse being passed around to the left and the right atrium. And when that electrical impulse arrives, it makes the two atriums contract. So any blood that was in the right or left atrium at that point will get squeezed through the valves into the ventricles. Okay? Meanwhile, the electrical impulse here has been passed on to the other yellow blob in the middle, which is called your atrioventricular node, but other yellow blob will do for now. And then that electrical impulse is passed down the middle and up the sides and around the two ventricles. And at that point, the ventricles contract and any blood that is in the ventricles will be sent off to the lungs on the right side or all around the body on the left side. And then the whole thing starts again with the sinus node producing another impulse. Okay? Good. All right. So that's what should happen. And if it does, then we can measure that little passage of electrical impulse around the heart. We can measure that on a graph. So I'm sure all of you have had an ECG at least once where they stick all these little sticky things all over you. Take off your hair off your chest if you're blown as well. <laughs> Um, and so when everything is working normally, we can measure that electrical activity and it will produce a little distinctive pattern on the ECG paper. And so it produces what we call a PQRST complex. You don't need to worry about that, but it's just to tell you that the doctor knows that every time your heart beats once, there should be a little bump, which we call a P wave. There should be this big spiky bit, which we call a QRS <coughs> complex. And there should be another little bump called a T wave. So we know every time your heart beats, we should be getting all of that on our graph paper. We also know how big the bump should be, and how big the spike should be, and how much space there should be between it all. So they can get quite a lot of information from an ECG about whether your heart is working properly on the electrical side of things. And if the blood supply to your heart muscle it's got a bit funny, so you've had an artery that's either narrowed or blocked at the time, then it makes the graph go a bit wonky as well. And that tells them more information about what might be going on that's making the electrics go funny as well. Any questions on that? <coughs> so ECGs are a good thing, we can get lots of information from them. So if it's found that there is anything affecting the production or the passage of the impulse, so the production of the impulse will be the yellow blobs. So if your yellow blobs are not working properly and not producing the impulse when they should, or if the passage of the electrical impulse is affected, so if your turquoise arrows are not doing their job by passing the message around properly, then it can cause an abnormal heart rhythm which the posh word for is arrhythmia. <coughs> so arrhythmia means irregular heart rhythm. And that can be seen when we do the ECG as well. So some arrhythmias, some abnormal heart rhythms, are completely harmless, so they might just be interesting, but we don't need to do anything about it because it doesn't pose any danger to you at all. Some of them you might need to take certain drugs for to try and help slow the heart rate or <coughs> speed the heart rate up, perhaps. Uh, and some you might be uh, told that you might need an implanted device, so either a pacemaker or one of these other devices. Is there anybody here that's had a pacemaker-type device done? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mr. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to pass that round as well then. So regardless of which type you have, they all look pretty similar and they look like that. Okay? And what's different is what's inside. Okay, so if I just pass that round as well. So pacemakers have been around for, for quite some time. So you've got your standard pacemaker that basically is taking over the job of your yellow blobs. So if your yellow blobs are not always working when they should do, a pacemaker will kick in and trigger those impulses when they need to happen. There are also cardiac resynchronization therapy or CRT devices that try to help the left and the right side of the heart work together a bit better and function a bit better together. And there are also ICD types, which are internal cardiac defibrillators. So these ones have the ability to actually shock the heart if you go into a very fast and dangerous heart rhythm that might cause your heart to stop. So all of that will be decided based on whatever your problem is. So you will go and see an electrophysiologist type cardiologist who specialises in looking at electrics and pacemakers um, and they will tell you which one they think will be best for you. But regardless of which type you're having, they're all put in pretty similarly. So what they do is put a cut along the left hand collarbone so that it's not particularly visible afterwards. Um, and they create a little pocket under the skin for that pacemaker to sit in. So it will be visible just under the skin there. You can see if someone's had a pacemaker, it's got a sort of round thing under the skin there. So that bit is visible. But then they attach some wires to it, which go down the blood vessels into the heart and are lodged in the places that we need to activate or stimulate. Okay? And then they sew up the hole that they've made, and you're usually out the same day. Or possibly the following morning, depending on how it goes, and what time they did you. <laughs> all right? Any question on pacemakers at all? No? You're on the homeward stretch now. Right? <laughs> Is there anybody here that has atrial fibrillation? Yes. Okay, so... Atrial fibrillation is one of the arrhythmias that I mentioned, so one of the irregular heartbeats, and it's probably one of the most common ones that we see. And so sometimes it just happens because we're getting older, and there's no other reason for it. Uh, sometimes it happens after you're diagnosed with a heart problem, so they might find you've got a heart problem, and at the same time notice that you've also got an irregular heartbeat. Or often it will happen after open heart surgery. So for a little while after open heart surgery, the heart goes a little bit loony for a while and perhaps will go into atrial fibrillation for a few weeks afterwards. But what it basically means is the atria, so the two top chambers of the heart, instead of squeezing and relaxing like they're supposed to, are fibrillating. So they're sort of wobbling like jelly. So if they do that instead of squeezing and relaxing, then it means that the blood flow is not quite so smooth around the heart. And it also means that blood can sit in the atria and hang about a bit too long. And that puts you at risk of stroke. <clears throat> because if it hangs around too long, it can clot, and then that can get thrown off into the blood vessels that go up to the head and cause a stroke. So if you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, they will want to put you on some sort of blood thinners to try and reduce that risk of a clot causing a stroke. But some people don't even know they've got atrial fibrillation because you might not get any symptoms with it at all. So you might feel perfectly fine, and it's only when they do an ECG that they feel uh, that you've got atrial fibrillation. Meanwhile, other people do have symptoms. They might have shortness of breath, palpitations or dizzy spells and then when we investigate further we find it's all caused by this irregular heartbeat problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, the last little section of this talk is looking at, we've done plumbing, we've done electrics, now we're going to talk about how powerful your pump is, so how well your heart can squeeze. So there's a term heart failure used for this. So if your heart is not squeezing as strongly as it should, and it's failing to pump as effectively as it should, the NHS word for that is heart failure. 
Uh, it doesn't sound very good, does it? If you're told that you have heart failure, your immediate response to that would probably be not good because it sounds like your heart is going to fail. That's not what it means. It means your heart is failing to pump as effectively as it can. In some hospitals around the country, they've actually started to call it heart function rather than heart failure because they know that it's got quite a bad association with patients. So what tends to happen is the doctors might not tell you that you've got this problem because they don't want to use the word heart failure and risk upsetting you or stressing you about it if they haven't got time to explain the ins and outs of it all. So in a nutshell, the heart muscle is failing to pump properly. And there's many causes of heart failure, some of which are here. So if you haven't got good blood flow to the heart muscle, it won't be able to squeeze and pump effectively. So that's the first one. If you've had a heart attack in the past and you didn't get to hospital quick enough to get it all sorted and get the blood clot fished out, it may be that you've got a bit of scarring on your heart muscle. There are some conditions where the heart muscle itself is abnormal, so it's not working the way it should do, and we call those cardiomyopathies. And some people will have heart failure because they have got an enlarged heart due to having a dodgy valve that's not working for a long, long time before anyone spotted it or having very high blood pressure for a number of years before anybody spotted it. All of those things are things that put the heart under extra pressure and start to um, cause a bit of heart failure. There are others, but we won't go into all of those. Okay? So for whatever reason, the heart isn't pumping as strongly as it should. Now you might know this uh, about yourself. If you've had an echo, this is one of the tests that they might use to assess how well your heart is squeezing and pumping. So they do an echo, which is the thing with the jelly on the chest, and they use an ultrasound probe to look at the heart structure. And one of the things they can me measure there is something called an ejection fraction, which is a measurement of how much blood is ejected from the heart when it squeezes. Okay, so a measurement of how much of the blood in the ventricle is ejected every time the heart beats. And normal ejection fraction is somewhere between 50 and 70%. So even if your heart is in tip-top condition, it may be that it only chucks 50% of the blood that's in the ventricle out with each beat. Okay, that's considered normal. So yours, if yours is lower than 50, then that would be considered in the category of heart failure. All right, so obviously 45 is just a little bit reduced. It can go down to sort of 10, 15% even. Okay. So in the paperwork that you might get copied in from the hospital, there might be a percentage mentioned. Yes, and it'll say EF and then a little percent after it. Or sometimes they just use three words to describe it. They'll either say severe LV dysfunction, mild LV dysfunction, or moderate. Okay, so mild, moderate, or severe LV, left ventricle, dysfunction. And that is talking about whether your left ventricle is squeezing enough. And it's all about the left ventricle, because if you remember right at the beginning of the talk, we talked about the fact that the left side of the heart has a lot more work to do than the right. So all these measurements are taken from the left ventricle, because the left ventricle is thicker and it's more muscular, because it has more work to do. And it tends to cause more of a problem for you if that side of the heart is not squeezing and pumping as it should. So you might want to go back to your paperwork at home, or if you're still coming through cardiac rehab with us, we may well have details on what they found when they did the test on you within your notes, and we can look at it and show it to you and talk to you about it if you don't know what yours already is. All right? So if you do have heart failure, sometimes it can cause these types of symptoms, and this is all to do with fluid retention. So because the heart muscle isn't squeezing and pumping as strongly as it should, what the body tends to try and do to help itself out is to try and squeeze some of the water that is inside the blood that's going around the body. Try and squeeze some of that water into any little available spaces it can find to try and make there less blood volume to pump around. Okay, which sounds like a good idea, but what, that ha what happens is that that blood, uh, that water, sorry, ends up either in the lungs, at the bottom of the lungs, where there's a bit of space, or in the venous circulation, which tends to follow gravity, and ends up all in your ankles. 
So some of the signs and symptoms of heart failure that you might notice yourself are being very out of breath, particularly when you try and lay down flat. So you try to prop yourself up with more pillows at night because you can't lay flat. Um, or having swollen ankles or even legs as well can make the lower legs swell too. And that is all caused by too much fluid being squeezed out of the bloodstream and into any spaces that are available in the body's sort of way of trying to help the heart out. So if we know you've got heart failure, we try and do certain things. We try and put you on certain pills. And we also try and talk to you about being careful how much fluid you drink and also how much salt you eat and drink. Because the more salt you eat and drink, the more your body will want to hold on to water to try and help sort of dissolve that salt, if you like. So certain types of pills, which we'll talk about after the coffee break as well anyway, try and reduce the amount of salt that's in your diet, both in drinks and in food. It may be that one of the types of pacemaker can actually help, particularly the CRT version, the one that gets the left and right side of the heart pumping together. That one is often a good idea for people in this category. Um, and then you may go and see the heart failure nurses at the hospital as well, who specialise in this and specialise in upping and downing the, do the doses of the tablets that you're on. And one of the things they recommend you to do is to take your weight at the same time every morning, wearing the same clothes. So usually they say, first thing in the morning when you get up, have a wee, and then weigh yourself. And then you can monitor that on a day-to-day -day basis because you can start to pick up signs that you are starting to retain more fluid if your weight is going up day by day. Okay, but there's a, a, a load of booklets over there for heart failure as well, which will explain all of this in a lot more detail, as will the heart failure nurses if you see them. And also exercise is a good idea for people in this category as well. So we have a whole separate talk about exercise, uh, but that's another good idea for people with heart failure to try and help themselves along the way.